Hello, Mount Sinai. Welcome to part two of a four-part series. This is a continuation of the Black History Month presentation. As you all know, our theme for this year is the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. First of all, allow me to say thank you for agreeing to share your story with us, Reverend Rose, with Mount Sinai, and with me as well. As we begin this interview, please tell us a little about yourself. My name is Miss Rose Marie London. My year of birth, 1943. My length of time with Mount Sinai. Um, I've been there all my life, but I joined when I was 12 years old. So that gives me 66 years. My family members, uh, Jonita Ross Williams, Mario Ross, Carlos Ross. All right. Thank you. How do you identify yourself? Or do you identify as African American, Black, Negro, mixed race, or colored? Africa, African American. Has this identification changed over time? Well, before it was African American, it was colored, then it was Negro, then it was black, and then they gave us African American. Is your cultural identity important to you? Why or why not? It's very important to me. Uh, I don't recall ever having a problem with my culture because that's the way God made me. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. When you were a child, who was the oldest person you knew, and what stories do you remember them sharing with you in relation to Black history? My mother's father and mother were the oldest ones. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time with them. Uh, my parents never had a car and never learned how to drive. So we didn't have a lot of time that we spent with them to sit around and talk about slavery or lynching or, or deaths. We didn't have that. Yeah. What story helped you to see that the world was not as you thought it should be? Oh, well, I guess a lot of since I've been in here, a lot of, well, you, I could see, I began to see the difference in the, the races mm -hmm. uh, and, and stories. Uh, some things I experienced myself as uh, in my young adult life, uh, working as a nurse, I saw things, uh, injustice, injustice. So it was a lot of injustice that that took place, and I knew it should not have been that way. And it happened with those that look like me. Was there anything you felt you couldn't do because of your race? I have never thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been the type of person that was... Uh, when I set my mind to do something, I've always succeeded because I have always been aggressive and independent. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Please share a moment when you experienced racism and what was your reaction to the situation? Well, you know, um, the way we grew up, right there in South Memphis, as they called it, a lot of their sub. Mm -hmm. We had our own neighborhoods, all black neighborhoods. And we went to, We had our own schools, like I said, our own churches. We had black entrepreneurs, as they called them. They had their own business back in those days. So we were among each other all the time and now. When we found out about the racism part was when we had to go downtown. We had to ride the bus to go downtown. That's when we experienced the racist part because 
Um, they had all of these uh, upscale stores uh, downtown, like uh, Goldsmiths and Breeze and Gerber's and Julius Lewis. Mm-hmm. Uh, those kind of places there, uh, it, it used to be a store. That it was, at first it was named Black and White, but then they changed it to Shane Birds. Mm-hmm. Now, when we went to shop, we could not shop on the upper floors. We had to shop in the basement. We had restaurants downtown that we couldn't go in the front door. If we wanted something out of the restaurant, we had to go around the side, down the alley, to the to the side door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, we had also, we had our own movie theaters. Uh, we had the New Daisy, which was down on Bill Street, Old Daisy. And we had the Ace Theater, which was right here on Mississippi and Walker. Mm-hmm. So when they changed it where we could uh, go to other movie theaters, like the Malco Theater, which was down there on Main Street, where the Orpheum is now, we had to go up the stairways on the side to go into the movie. We couldn't go in the front door. So they had an area for us upstairs in the balcony. How did all that make you feel? Well, you know, I didn't even give it a whole lot of thought at that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't give it a lot of thought because, like I say, uh, we just took it as it was. We attended these things, like I said, in our neighborhoods. We had everything we needed in our neighborhoods at that time. So um, we we uh, we just go to what they had given us. Mm-hmm. But see, people didn't talk a whole lot back then. Mm-hmm. They didn't talk a lot about no racism. Um, why do you feel like they didn't talk about racism a lot? <clears throat> I guess they was, um, a lot of them kept things, I guess they just kept things to themselves because, uh, you know, like my grandmother now, she was, she was not a slave, but her family and some of her descendants were slaves. Mm-hmm. But they just didn't talk about it. It just didn't ever come up uh, when they was around us or we was around them. And mm-hmm. even people in the neighborhood, we like to say, we lived in the village. Yeah. and But they just didn't talk about nothing like that. So we, I didn't experience it. We just didn't experience that mm-hmm. until later on when we was in school and we started hearing all about the slavery. Um, how did those events affect your life? Like the racism, and I know you said your family never really talked about it, but um, maybe in the past or even in the present, how did it affect your life or your family life today or in the past? And does it still affect you till this day? Mm, like I say, it didn't, um, I just knew that there was a difference as I got older. I just knew it was a difference. But at the same time, um, I didn't let it affect me to the point where, uh, I'm trying to say, I didn't let it affect me to the point where my father used to teach us, uh, my father taught us a lot of pride back in the day, back then. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like I could do, it was nothing like I, I, that I couldn't do, no matter with, with my skin color. Yeah. Because of what they had done. Yeah. That's the best I can describe it to you. Do you feel attitudes have changed since segregation? Some degree it has and some it hasn't. It's still there. <laughs> <laughs> you it's might- still there. Elaborating on that? Uh, it's more like back then, it's more like they um, they hid behind, you know, hooters, as I call them, white hooters and capes and, and all that. They hid behind that back then, but now they do it openly. They don't hide behind nothing, and they don't care 
who knows who they are, because a lot of them are officials, I put it like that, but they don't care. They don't care anymore. So there's not a, there's not, there has not been a great change in attitudes towards we black people. Yes. It's not a change. It's not. It's, you, got, you got some that's in it, different generations that feel different, but then you got so many of them that that stuff is embedded in them, and they may laugh and and talk with you, and but at the same time, if something takes place, it's gonna come out. Yeah. What's done in the dark always comes to the light. There you go. Mhm. Mm yeah. Um, earlier, you mentioned that you um, did a lot of nursing, um, and you said you had some um, incidents within while you, while you was nursing that you had, that you had seen. Would you mind elaborating on that some? Well, when I speak of that, I mean things, it's patients that came into the system. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of injustice, like uh, abuse, uh, police brutality. Mm -hmm. um, then you had, then the other, I had doctors uh, that would come to see their patients making rounds. I had to make rounds with them. And older women or men, they wouldn't address them by their names. They would address them as girls or boys. Mm -hmm. And I had an instructor, she was one of the best, who was, looked just like me. And she always taught us to speak up for our patients. So I... Well, always, I've I experienced t telling the doctor one day, I say, you call her a girl? And he looked at me real funny. And I said, she's old enough to be your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, and she could be. But, yeah, we had to correct them as to <clears throat> not to call them girls and boys. Yes. And also my instructor, like I said, she looked just like me. And they would call her Nurse Watson. Mm -hmm. And she had to go to administration and let them know, you need to have a talk with your doctors because they address me as Nurse Watson. My name is Miss Watson. Mm -hmm. So uh, another thing, when we worked in the OBGYN, part of the hospital and we had our young ladies look just like me to come in in labor and they let them lay up there and hurt while they're going through their labor and we had to question them about why you're not giving them pain medicine and they, the answer was black women can take more pain than people of their color Mm -hmm. And so we had to get that changed. My instructor had to get that changed. Mm -hmm. It's sad that it's kind of still happening today because um, recently a professor of mine was telling me about an experience that she had in the emergency room that, that they would not treat her pain at all because they felt like she was overdoing it. Wow. And she was in labor? Yes, ma'am. She was in lane. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in labor. And they wouldn't give her any um, pain meds. It was after she um, delivered the baby because they felt like she was overdoing it, even though her record never showed that she was a pain medication seeking. Um, mm -hmm. No, nah, see, that should have been, that should have been reported. <laughs> oh, she, she won the lawsuit. She sued. <laughs> she won the lawsuit. She I was, wanted what? She um, sued the um, hospital. And she won. And she won the, the lawsuit. So I was, I was glad that she. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm glad she did that yeah, because I, we women who have had children and been in labor, we know the kind of pain that we experience. And a lot of women have died in childbirth because they did not give them pain medicine. Yeah.
what are your thoughts on mental slavery? My thoughts on mental slavery? Yes. Okay. Mental slavery? Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of us that look like us. <laughs> that still dwells on, they still in bondage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They are still in bondage. To some extent, they are still in bondage. Uh, they still blaming the white man. And what my point of view is that God has freed us by taking the chains off, and yet many of us continue to live in bondage. Because God has given us the freedom now we can do just about whatever we want to do. But we have to go through a lot of changes to get there. But you don't have to be in bondage. You don't have to look at him and say, uh, a lot of people can't take it and they'll drop out. They'll drop out because of what they, the changes they, they experience while they're trying to go get to the top. A lot of them can't take that. So then, naturally, they want to blame. But we have to fight. Uh, we we in a child. We have to fight now. Uh, we have we meet a lot of challenges, yeah. a great deal of them. And it's gonna always be that way, long as there's a world. There's a, and we are in this world. No matter how far God has brought us from, we gonna still meet those challenges. But with the help of God, we can make it through it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you think people are? Um, my apologies. What would you like to see for growth within the Black family with representation, identity, and diversity? Uh, the growth in Black families. It has been such a a big change from our generations and the generations that are here now, um, the first thing is in a family, it can be two-parent household, a single parent female, or single, you know, we have males that are single parents now raising children. But they need to know God. Because the way it is now, um, they have these attitudes. They don't want nobody. Uh, as they said, uh, they don't want nobody to discipline their children. They want to be the ones to do it. Mm-hmm. And but they they have to teach the children. I mean, like I said, you we have to have God in us to to do this. We have to teach your children by example. Your children can't see you doing everything. Mm-hmm. If they've been exposed to so much inside the box. They've been exposed to so much outside the box. Then they have parents that are using all kind of profanity, uh, abusing them physically, mentally, emotionally, and if a child grows up like that, that's, that's, that stays in them. So that's a cycle that's going to be repeated. But I would like to, like I said, see parents now, uh, they need to get to know God. And when they do that, they, they need to teach their children how to be a man, how to be a father, how to be a woman, and how to be a mother. But they also have to let them know that they are very important they are unique, yes. and they have worth. They need to know that. But if you, if they seeing you do everything, it takes a great effect on them for the rest of their lives. Yes. So that's what we, that's what needs to be done. Identity. It says I heard somebody uh, some years a long time ago. They said. Uh, uh, especially when it came to a man, they said by the time a man turned 40 years old, if he don't know who he is uh, uh, or what it is that he really wants to do, 
she ain't gonna never amount to anything. <laughs> but that's not always that easy to do. But a lot of them, it has happened because a lot of them waste the time. Then another thing when it comes to the family, um, a lot of our men wasn't taught how to be fathers. They had fathers in the household, uh, and they was not taught how to become a man or an, and to be a father. They just thought that they, they just could have a family, but it's, it's more to it than just having a family. I have a friend that spoke that to me once, and he said the way he learned about that, he had to go see a psychiatrist. And when the psychiatrist starts talking about his identity and him being a father, he said, well, he had to think about it. He said, well, nobody really ever taught me how to be a man or how to be a father. So our children need to know uh, because a lot of things, a lot of time, our children, even children that, that's in households have been taught how to become a man or how to become a female or how to become a mother or become a, a father. But then the way it's going now, they meet all these challenges all the time and they come into groups or be around people or get, sometimes you hear them say, well, I'm just trying to fit in. Mm. But we have to teach them, you don't have to fit in. You have to be who you are. But see, they want to fit in because they got so many bullies now. They bully them. So in, to keep them from bullying them, they rather try to fit in because they know if they get bullied, they're going to get beat. Because these bullies will beat them. Because they won't join in with them. Yeah. So we have to let them know how important they are and they don't have to try to fit in. They just, they, you know... Um, and diversity. Diversity. Um, diversity comes from within. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. hey, it comes um, from within. Elaborate. Huh? Can you elaborate a bit more on that, please? Like, what do you Diver mean by that? It comes in within from you wanting to make a change, wanting to be better, wanting to know uh, how important you are, Wanting to know that, like I said, you can do what you set your mind to do. You can always do it. Mm. But we have so many now that, you know, we have so many dropouts. We have, I know, young people that don't even know how to read to a certain level. Uh, like I said, they have gone through so much and still going through so much, so they are really confused about a whole lot. Thank you. Is there anything that you would um, like to say? Because we are um, at the end of the interview. Is there anything that's on your mind or your heart that you would just like to say that you would like people to know? Um. <clears throat> Um, I, um, just want people to learn how to accept who they are, learn to accept who you are. A lot of people don't accept who they are, but I, I had to learn myself, uh, that God made me the way I am. And I, I meet people, I mean, there's a lot of people right now that don't accept me for being Rose, but I didn't make Rose. God made me. And see, 
it, with me, it was like I had some experiences in life that I felt like that I, nobody loved me. So when somebody did approach me, and I'm thinking, well, they love me. But it took me a long time. I was in my 50s when I realized that God loves me more than I love myself. And from then on, I said, from now on, I'm going to love Rose. I'm going to love myself. And I'm not going to allow nobody to pull me down. So we have to learn. God loves us more than we love ourselves. So we have to learn to love yourself. Be who he has made you to be. And don't let allow anyone to take that away from you. Once again, thank you for very, very much for sharing a little bit about you and your thoughts on the Black family, their representation, identity, and diversity. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope I help you all in some safe form or fashion. <laughs> <laughs> you have. It was, it was very nice to hear your perspective on these questions and the fact that you was actually able to elaborate and share. It was really, it was really breathtaking and I'm in awe. But I love hearing well, thank you. elders. And you too. Thank you and love. I love you and thank God bless you. And in your school and your, your, I mean, as what you're striving to be and you can be what you want to be. He has given you that gift. You stick with it. Thank you. Mm-hmm.